Good evening. I'm Kevin Butterfield. I'm the Executive Director of the Washington Library at George Washington's Mount Vernon, and I'm coming to you from that library for an exciting Ford Evening Book Talk with Patrick O'Donnell. I want to thank the Ford Motor Company for sponsoring not just this talk, but many, many talks over the years. A great series where we have authors come and talk about their newest works, and it doesn't get any newer than this, because this is the book release for this exciting book, The Indispensables. I do want to mention one upcoming program in just two nights. We have our third Michelle Smith lecture, uh, Richard Bernstein, R.B. Bernstein, and his, book new, his new book, The Education of John Adams. Tickets are still available. It's an exciting event. Please consider joining us on Wednesday night. Tonight's exciting program, filmed live from the Karen Bookwald Wright Reading Room here in Mount Vernon, uh, is uh, the official book launch of Patrick O'Donnell's new book, The Indispensables, with the subtitle, The Diverse Soldier Marines Who Shaped the Country, formed the Navy, and rode Washington across the Delaware. Officially released by Atlantic Monthly Press today. I want to let you know that we have a number of autographed copies uh, that are going out as gifts to people who submitted questions for this event. We've got some exciting questions lined up. Please also, uh, during the tonight's talk, submit questions. Let us know what you want to know from Patrick, and we can ask those questions here tonight. Uh, this is a great uh, book. I, I couldn't put it down over the last week. Uh, it was reviewed just today in the Wall Street Journal. Uh, they call, they uh, called it uh, uh, a novel-like account of this fascinating story that you're about to hear about from Patrick. Uh, Fast-paced writing, it, it really moves very, very quickly. You learn more about gunpowder gun powder than you think you might. Uh, it's an exciting story, and there's a lot to hear uh, from this great account of the Indispensables. Uh, to tell you a little bit more about Patrick O'Donnell, because he won't tell you these things himself, he's a best-selling, critically acclaimed military historian an expert on elite units. Uh, this is actually his second book on the Revolutionary War period. Uh, the uh, first one, uh, Washington's Immortals, the untold story of the elite regiment who changed the course of the revolution, uh, got him down this path. Uh, and then he came to the Washington Library as a research fellow uh, to work on this book uh, that you're about to hear about. Uh, he also has received awards uh, for his books like Beyond Valor, uh, which covered the Second World War, uh, this is actually his 12th book, exciting work done across the years, across the generations. Uh, he's done important historical work with American soldiers in combat in Iraq. He has provided historical consulting work for, for projects like Band of Brothers, for dozens of documentaries on different aspects of American military history. And most important of all, like I've already suggested, he worked on his book here at Mount Vernon as a fellow here at the Washington Library. I'm so excited to welcome you to this talk and to introduce you to Patrick O'Donnell. Thank you so much, Kevin, for, for uh, that introduction. And it's really good to, be co to, become, to come home. Um, so much of my uh, research for the Indispensables was here at this library where um, I literally rebuilt the Marblehead Regiment from the ground up from muster rolls using their pension files, diaries, letters, etc., to recreate this, um, this regimen, this story, which is really, truly extraordinary. Um, this is, every book that I've ever written has been a journey. Each one of these books has found me in one way or another, and this is no exception. But before I uh, embark upon a book, I always ask a very basic question. Who cares? Why does it matter? Literally, this library, our country, wouldn't be here had it not been for these individuals that I wrote about, men and women, in the Indispensables. They saved our country multiple times. They shaped our country, they formed the Navy, and they saved Washington's army on numerous occasions, which I'm going to talk about tonight. The book is also a window into current events in many ways. It's about a virus that divides Americans politically, about cancel culture, it's about misinformation, it's about disarmament. There's a lot of things in this book that really, really resonate with people. But let me just sort of take you back right now into one of the most crucial periods in the American Revolution, the American Dunkirk. The Battle of Brooklyn had just been waged, and America had lost bad, badly. Washington's army was, was defeated. The Marylanders, who I wrote a book called Washington's Immortals, had bought us an hour more precious in our history than any other, where Washington's, with a, a desperate rear guard action, Washington's army was able to retreat into fortifications at Brooklyn Heights. 
the British Army, which had surrounded the, uh, the American Army there, was about to um, come, around, uh, come up the East River, and also siege lines were creeping forward. And it was a perilous time. It was a time in our history where it all could be lost. Washington had a decision to make. Was he going to retreat or fight? And Washington wisely decided to retreat. And this is a time when all could be lost. The entire army could be surrounded and destroyed. And it was the, everything really rested upon the shoulders of the men in the book that I've written about, the Marblehead men. Washington decided to retreat, and he had to cross a, a, a mile-long river, the East River. And, and this is, um, let me just sort of take you back in time to August 29th, August 30th. There had been a massive nor'easter that had pelted both armies for two days straight after the Battle of Brooklyn. The siege lines had been creeping forward into um, the, the American positions at Brooklyn Heights, and, and, and um, Lord Howell's army was closer and closer to annihilating the American army. Washington decides to escape, and it's John Glover and the Marblehead men, they, they basically gather all of the boats that are in Manhattan, and they man those boats, and they ferry the army across the East River. And this is not an easy task. The East River at the time is swirling. There's, the wind isn't cooperating. And on top of that, a loyalist sees what's happening and sends an enslaved individual with, with, within her, um, in her household to the British lines to try to inform Lord Howe that the Americans are escaping. This individual ha, you know, wanders upon some Hessian soldiers who speak German. and. They're not able to understand what he's trying to say, fortunately. But the Americans are evacuating. Glover doesn't even know it until a couple hours before the evacuation that he has to pull off one of the, the greatest retreats in, in American history and world history. And they man the boats. And as they man the boats, the wind doesn't cooperate. And the tides are horrendous. But there's something very special about these men. They have worked together for years at the Grand Banks, fishing the Grand Banks, the most treacherous waters in the world. What makes them unique is they're also arguably the first diverse regiment in the United States Army. Here, it's African Americans, Native Americans, White Americans, Hispanic Americans, they're all working together. And they work together at the Grand Banks. It's a situation where race didn't matter in life and death situations where Literally, the weather could change people, could kill people. And they had to rely upon one another. And they were relying upon one another that night to pull off one of the greatest retreats in history as they rode across the river. Tides weren't working. The wind wasn't working. The, the, uh, the entire evacuation was about to be called off. But the person that was delivering the message to Washington couldn't find Washington that night. They still went. And Glover's men pushed them across. And against all odds, they, they, they conducted the retreat. At that time, the wind changed in, in, the, in, the, in the favor of Americans. And the, the, the Glover's men were able to transport the army across the East River. In one case, a remark almost a dozen times against all odds. And as, that, as, as dawn was coming, a miraculous fog appeared and screened, continued to screen the movements of, of the army as it was crossing. And John Glover and the Marblehead men from Massachusetts delivered the army to safety. Nearly 10,000 men were delivered to safety. This is one reason which makes them indispensable. They saved the army that time, but it would not, it'd be one of many situations. And literally two weeks later, the British land again at Kipps Bay. And it's the Marbleheaders that make a stand while the rest of the army retreats. It's here that Washington is even catatonic as the British are attacking. He's, his, his horse, he and his horse are frozen practically in time. Somebody has to literally come and bring him out of the battle as the British are advancing towards him literally hundreds of yards away. Marbleheaders make the stand as the army melts away. 
They melt the, the army melts away, the, ar the, the Marbleheaders make this, this desperate rear guard stand, and they're able to reform at the Battle of Harlem Heights, and there's a small victory. And it's, it's the Marbleheaders that are involved in some really interesting operations during this time period where they conduct raids against the British lines. The Marbleheaders, in many ways, are a precursor to special operations units that we know today. They are, um, are doing things that are really special and extraordinary. They launch fire ships against the British prior to the Battle of Brooklyn, where they nearly take out what's equivalent to a British battleship, but they launch raids. They also form what's known as the Guard the Commander-in-Chief's Guard or the Lifeguard. And the Lifeguard is really an extraordinary unit. It's a precursor in many ways to the Secret Service. It's Washington's hand-picked men that guard him. And it's not a small group of men. It mushrooms up to 200 men. And these men are involved in operations, in battles, but they also guard His Excellency's papers. They, are, they act as his aide-de-camp in many ways, and it's a marble header that, is le that leads this unit and shapes it, informs it. It's quite a, an extraordinary uh, story in and of itself. But not only do they save and protect the unit, but there's a little bit of mystery involved. Prior to the Battle of Brooklyn, there are several members of the Guard that have leanings towards the British, loyalties, if you will. And they are lured into a plot to assassinate Washington. And that untold, relatively unknown story is told in the Indispensables as well. They uncover the plot, luckily, and the guard actually protects Washington and they take out their own. And the first, um, the first American to be executed is a member of the guard. But that's a quite fascinating story. As, as the, as the uh, book moves forward, it's, Washing, it's um, the indispensables that are Washington's elite force in many of the battles in New York. And um, the British once again land up in, um, up in, northern, uh, in the northern part of Manhattan at a place called Throngs, um, uh, Throngs Point. And it's here that the Marbleheaders, along with a, uh, an assortment of other units, basically repel an amphibious invasion from the greatest um, navy of the world at the time, the Royal Navy, which is an extraordinary feat in and of itself. They land a little bit further up the coast at Pelham Bay or Pell's Point. And it's here that Glover's army, or I'm sorry, Glover's um, but brigade which includes the Marblehead Regiment, once again, um, save the army. And they, they, they fight uh, initially close to the landing point, but they fall back, and it's a collapsible defense. It's kind of a, an emerging part of the American way of war, which is unique and ever-changing, and it's still ever-changing to this day. But we were not using conventional tactics of European armies. We're falling back from a fixed position. In this case, um, they were falling back behind stone walls and allowing the British to advance, but still taking down many, many of their numbers. And it's here that the, um, the indispensables help really save the Washington's army once again. And, you know, from this point on, you enter uh, Fort Washington where many, many Americans are, are, uh, are captured, nearly 3,000 Americans, including some Marbleheaders that were captured early on uh, during the, uh, during the uh, that, are, that, are, that are basically wounded, um, but are recovering in Fort Washington and are captured by the British. And you know, so much of this book consists of pension application files that are in many ways, the unknown oral histories of the American Revolution. If you were lucky enough to survive the American Revolution, you could apply for a pension application in 1820. Um, and you'd go down to the local courthouse, 
and swear under oath what you saw and did. And here are some of the great um, oral history accounts of what happened during the war that are untapped, and it's in their own words. And the indispensables is, is filled with these unknown stories from unknown Americans. It's a boots on the ground kind of band of brothers, very much uh, a cinematic telling of the war. Novelesque is what the Wall Street Journal said today in their review. Um, but it also has a th over a thousand end notes. All of it is, all of, the, all of the words in the book from these Americans are, are true statements from their accounts. It's not uh, something that I made up. But it, it, within, this, within these accounts, within the story, is what happened and what they saw and did. And it's very compelling in many cases. And as we enter November and December, this is the darkest days, some of the darkest days of America. Things are politically collapsing. The military victories that the British Army has obtained from Brooklyn, from Fort Washington, from the other victories has caused a swing within the United States where people are abandoning the cause. New Jersey, people are signing um, oaths of allegiance to the crown. Congressmen, people that have uh, signed the Declaration of Independence are now jumping sides. Things are changing. The, um, the um, enlistments within the regiments are all set to expire, and they are expiring. Washington's army is literally melting away within, uh, within his eyes, and he's not He's, he decides that he must do something. It's, very, it's a very desperate situation. And he decides to attack um, the Hessian outpost in Trenton. And it's here that um, the Marbleheaders have perhaps their finest hour. It's a situation where everything changes. Everything is on the line. Everything is about to collapse. And it's on the shoulders of the Marbleheaders once again. The Washington is, has an elaborate plan. He always has um, often elaborate plans. There are four prongs that are going to attack um, Trenton. The Marbleheaders are, are, are basically taking the army across the Delaware River on the main prong. But the other three prongs are also going forward. All of them fail except the Marbleheaders. Only the Marbleheaders had the skill to cross the Delaware River, which is filled with ice, which is fast flowing. There is a nor'easter that night. Nothing is going according to plan. Um, all of the other um, prongs to, the, to Washington's offensive fail. But the Marbleheaders are able to get the army across intact. At least one portion of it. The other three fail. And that night, they're behind schedule. They're about 12 miles above Trenton, and they have to march through sleet and snow into Trenton. Much of the army at this time is barefoot. Some of their, their, their literally, their tracks are filled with, with blood in the snow. But they push forward. The Marbleheaders are leading part of the um, element. They push down towards the um, southern port of, por portion of Trenton. And this is a very, very important point. Without orders, they attack a key bridge, known as the Aston Peak Bridge. They capture the bridge along with the guards. And then they set up a series of cannons on the high ground. Meanwhile, the rest of, Mor of Washington's army is attacking Johann Rall. During most 18th century engagements, both armies or both sides battle it out, and then when one side is about is is being um, is 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 not doing well, they retreat. Johann Rall had no avenue of retreat, thanks to John Glover and the Indispensables. They captured the bridge, they sealed the retreat, and they sealed the fate of Johann Rall's um, entire regiment which changed the course of history. Um, and from there, the army sails back across the Delaware, thanks to the Marblehead men. And uh, it's 
unfortunately, a little bit worse than the, the trip over because the men had captured the rum supply. And it was a drunken cruise back over, and several men fell over. But they captured Roll, most of Rawls' regiment. They captured a large stand of arms and many cannon. And then it sets up a week later, roughly a week later, the, battle of, the Second Battle of Trenton, or the Second Battle of Assing Peak Creek, where Washington doesn't necessarily want to fight, but his hand is sort of forced by um, a militia group, the Philadelphia Associators, which go over a little bit early, they, without orders, and Washington decides to reinforce them. And they hold a key bridge against all odds. Half the Marblehead Regiment, maybe less or a little bit more, it's really hard to tell, stays with Washington. The other group is exhausted and they go back to Marblehead. But that group that stays fights at Assunpink Creek, they fight at the Battle of Princeton, and they change the course of history. It's the 10 crucial days that change the course of history, these three battles. And it's the Marbleheaders that are in the four that make a difference, but the story doesn't end there. And what I mean by that is it's a Marbleheader that once again saves the army. And I'll get to that story in a minute. But first, I want to go through several of the characters of the book so that you get a feel for what this book is about. The first character, if you will, or individual that I'd like to highlight is John Glover. He's the central character of the Indispensables. And John Glover is a self-made man. He fights during the French and Indian War. He's a cobbler. He's also a bartender. And with the money that he makes from bartending and cobbling shoes, he's able to buy a ship. And then he's able to buy more ships. And he, he builds a fleet of um, and ships and becomes a very wealthy man within Marblehead itself um, through trading. And Marblehead's fortunes are made on fish. Cod is the commodity in Marblehead. And it's a third of the economy in Massachusetts in 1774. They fish the Grand Banks. And the Grand Banks are some of the most treacherous waters in the world at the time. It's, it's icy, it's, it's thousands of miles away from Boston, but they sail up there and they fish, they, they gather fish, and they, you know, it's a life and death situation many times against these giant waves, against storms, but they're working together. And Marblehead's a diverse community. It's a, it's, it has um, Native Americans, it has free African Americans, it has, Hispanic Americans, um, these individuals are ahead of their time uh, in many ways. It's a progressive town for its time. Many of the men in, in, in the Indispensables are ardent abolitionists. They were at the forefront of American civil rights before there were civil rights. And they were ardently pushing for the abolition of slavery, including John Glover. Um, and it's these crews that are um, diverse, that are working together, but it's also a situation where the crown is interfering with their lives. And they're interfering with their lives constantly. They're impressing, their, John Glover's and crews are impressed by the British Navy. Literally, literally come alongside of a ship, board the ship, and then say, you're, you're gonna be a member of the Royal Navy. You're effectively a slave for life. And that individual is taken aboard the, a Royal Navy ship and, and made a member of the Royal Navy for life. And there's no freeing that individual unless they escape, and some did. But this is a factor that causes a break from Great Britain. It's one of the factors. Regulation, excessive regulation. Glover's enterprises were were regulated by the crown 3,000 miles away. In, in 1775, something called the Fisheries Act would be, would be um, established where the crown would literally not allow the Marbleheaders to fish the Grand Banks, effectively putting out of work the entire town. 
which caused a great deal of resentment. Their judges were, were, um, were taken away from them and installed with royal officials. Their government was changed. All of these issues fomented a political change within the colonies, within Marblehead. Marblehead would become the spearhead, along with Boston, of the revolution. It would also be an idea mainspring of the revolution. And it was the Marbleheaders that would play a critical role in this. But in 1773 and 74, the ships from Marblehead also brought home with it a virus that changed America and changed the town. The town would be divided politically. The virus was smallpox, and people within the town were being infected. But the patriots within the town came up with a novel plan to create an inoculation hospital to try to publicly deal with the, the virus itself, which was causing these political fissures and causing massive death. And if you're familiar with smallpox, it would cause pustules across the face and the back to scar people, and it would kill you in many cases, and it was highly contagious. They set up pest houses to sort of contain the virus, but the inoculation hospital, which was cutting edge for the time, was set up by John Glover, Elbridge Gerry, Nathaniel Bond, and many of the other main characters in this book. The Loyalists weren't on board, though. And as the hospital um, started to, to um, produce results, it also produced some in, or revised some infections, which the Loyalists used to their advantage to incite the mob. And dozens of men rode uh, on boats to Cat Island, where the, the inoculation hospital occur, was um, in place, and they burned it to the ground with the people inside. Remarkably, nobody was killed. But the, the, the loss of the hospital cost John Glover and the other um, patriots in the town over 2,000 pounds in damages. So they put out a writ to, to, um, for the sheriff to get the men that had done that. They seized those individuals, and they were brought to jail for trial. The loyalists in the town used the, the, the situation of the, of, of the virus to incite the mob, and they attacked the jail with, with hundreds of individuals. They broke into the doors of the jail with axes and crowbars and freed the two men. And at that point, the main characters of the book, their houses are surrounded by the angry mob which are hell-bent on potentially killing them all. And John Glover came up with a very novel solution to deal with the problem. And his, his version of self-defense was to wheel a cannon inside the foyer of his house. And, he, and, he, and I, I recall finding in the original papers from his family, I'll fix him, was his quote. And as the mob circled the house, hundreds of men ready to kill him, he ordered the doors thrust open, and the cannon was there in the foyer facing the mob. And he had a torch in his hand, and he told them to disperse. And they did. He, he made his stand. And it was, a, it was emblematic of, of, of what, um, you know, how John Glover would conduct himself through the rest of the war. And it's, it's here that, um, you know, after. It, it's John Glover and Elbridge Gerry that are bringing in the main supplies of gunpowder through their contacts with Spain prior to the Revolutionary War. And as the war moves forward, John Glover is involved in Lexington and Concord. He's involved in many of the other battles. And he also has the job of guarding, Glover, of guarding General Washington prior to the Battle of Bunker Hill at the Vassal House. And it's here that John Glover forges a very special relationship with the commander-in-chief. And he forms a level of trust. And his trust, it's, it's General Washington that looks upon John Glover to solve a problem for him. Gunpowder is the crucial unum necessarium, as John M. says. The colonists had plenty of guns. They had no gunpowder. And the British knew it, and they tried to disarm us through gunpowder. But it would be the contacts that the Marbleheaders had with Spain that brought in that crucial gunpowder. 
but it would also be a novel way that Washington would try to capture more gunpowder by attacking the British stores in Halifax. But he needed a ship or ships to do that operation. So he turned to John Glover to create a navy. And the navy, which is really kind of preposterous, is to take basically a fishing boat that John Glover had, the Hannah, which was about 74 tons, and somehow take on the greatest navy of the world at the time, the Royal Navy. But that's exactly what they did. And they attacked British ships. And the story of the Navy is extraordinary. It's some of the most colorful captains in American history. It's Captain Coit, the Red Dragon that has a giant cloak, of the red cloak that he wears, that has an incredible sense of humor. Cyan Martindale, who decides to outfit his ship with six guns, spend a lavish amount of money, but as soon as the ship gets out of port, he's immediately captured by the British. And Cyan Martindale sells out his crew to the British at trial. And Cyan Martindale has a really amazing story. They put his crew in irons. They put many of them, they are impressed in Royal Navy vessels. And uh, he is freed with some of his officers. They make his way to, he makes his way to, um, to Maine where he, he's imprisoned as well by the British Navy but somehow escapes on foot and makes his way down the East Coast all the way to Washington, spinning tales of grand, that grand tales of his heroics in the process. And um, I'll let that, he goes on to fight again, but is lost at sea. And, and you know, there are so many amazing stories within the Navy itself. They attack Canada without authorization. There's a mutiny, one of the first in the, in, in, the um, in United States history, but they also capture critical powder ships at the right time at the right place. Another individual that I'd like to talk about is Dr. Nathaniel Bond. He's a Harvard-trained resurrectionist. A resurrectionist is a body snatcher. Dr. Bond was, um, there was a critical shortage of cadavers at the time, and People would literally, doctors would raid graveyards to snatch bodies to work on them to find out their anatomy. But Dr. Bond is really an extraordinary hero. He's on Cat Island, you know, working on the inoculation, and it's here that um, he saves many marble headers. He's at the forefront of smallpox, it's his specialty, it's his expertise. Dr. Bond is also a, med, a member of the Marblehead Regiment and, and trains with them, drills with them. He participates in the Battle of Lexington and Concord. But according to his Hippocratic Oath, which he follows very seriously, he treats the British soldiers that are wounded at Lexington and Concord. For it, he's canceled. The patriots in the town believe that he is now a loyalist and his house is surrounded. And he writes an extraordinary letter, which I have here in my hand, the original parchment, where he begs for his life to Elbridge Gerry, saying that there are thousands of people that will kill him at any moment. Please send a detail of men to bring me to a court martial so I can reveal the true facts of what happened. And he confides and his true friend, Joseph Warren, as well as Elbridge Gerry, and they have the court-martial, and the facts are revealed, and Dr. Bond is exonerated from, you know, fake crimes, that he didn't, he didn't do anything wrong. He just helped people, which is, which is what he's supposed to do. But instead of melting away and, being, um, and not being happy with the situation, he decided to fight, and he joined the Marblehead Regiment as their surgeon. And Dr. Bond then goes on to be a company commander. And he fights through all of the major battles of the American Revolution, which is really, I mean, extraordinary in and of itself. And at the Battle of Trenton, when about half the regiment goes back to Marblehead, and they have a reason for going back. The Mar Marblehead at the time is economically devastated. Many of their wives are starving. 
They go back to protect their wives and their loved ones and their families. Dr. Bond stays on, along with many of the other men. They continue to stay on, and it's Washington himself that asked Dr. Bond to inoculate the army. At the time, the virus was killing nearly 20% of the army. It was being devastated by it. And Dr. Bond sets up all the inoculation facilities. He supervises and manages the entire process and inoculates the army. One historian claims it's Washington's greatest strategic decision to inoculate the army, because then they're able to fight and continue to the battle. But for it, the man that was initially canceled, the man that was initially labeled a loyalist, dies and perishes from his own, from, from basically inoculating the army. Those are some of the characters in the book, along with Elbridge Gerry, a forgotten founder. My favorite word for Elbridge Gerry is grumbletarian kind of ornery guy that was bird-like, skinny. He was the um, intellectual mainspring, in many ways, of the early revolution. It's Elbridge Gerry that believes in republicanism with a small r. It's, it's service to country over self. And he takes abstract com, uh, concepts and really makes them reality. But he also takes one of the largest trading fleets in the colonies, which he and his family own, and converts them into supply lines. As I mentioned earlier, the Unum Necessarium was gunpowder. All of the major operations that the British were conducting at the early part of the war were to take and disarm Americans and, and take our vital supply of gunpowder. Without gunpowder, no revolution could be fought. But it's Gary that comes up with the concept, and he's one of the first in writing to talk about foreign alliances. And he and other Marbleheaders forged the alliance with Spain. And it's through his contacts that last 30 to 40, that, he, that have gone on for 20 or 30 years, that he, that he forges this vital relationship and they bring in the powder to the colonies. Um, he's also a future vice president. He's the um, future congressman. Gerrymandering is named after him. Bill of Rights, the Electoral College, all of these things are part of Elbridge Gerry. The last thing I'm going to talk about very quickly is the diverse members of this unit. In many cases, we only know them by their, their first name. It's, um, in some cases, a Roman name or a Greek name. It's Cato. Uh, these are extraordinary individuals that are unsung and forgotten. The importance of the Marble Hedge Regiment is not necessarily one strength. There's a strength is their diversity, but their greatest strength was their unity. And these men working together as a team. And there are incredible members of this, this regiment, such as Caesar Glover, Manuel, Manuel, Manuel Soto, Cuff Wood, Cato Prince, that I, I looked up their pension files, and these men died penniless. But they fought through the entire war in the most epic and great operations of the war, bringing the, the Marblehead Regiment, bringing the army to safety. Um, multiple times. These are the forgotten members of the revolution. They're all extraordinary in what they did. And it's, it's you know, a diversity and model that we wouldn't see tragically for over 170 years in America's armed forces. But these are the men that were in, men and women, the book covers some incredible women in this book as well that did extraordinary things. They were at the right place at the right time. In many cases, that there's the sacrifice that they made is epic. Marblehead alone had over 600 widows at the end of the American Revolution. And it's, it's, it's that story, it's that sacrifice, it's the reason why I wrote 
the indispensables for that for what they the debt that I don't I think that most Americans don't necessarily appreciate our founding story is our greatest story and it's um, marble headers that changed the course of history thank you very much I'm happy to take questions this has been a great uh, introduction to this book. I'm so excited for people to have a chance to read it, uh, which they can now do. But I also have some questions coming in. Uh, and there's a question that I, I really like from Michelle uh, about the cohesiveness of this unit. Uh, she asks, how did a diverse group become a cohesive unit? And this is something you've studied in another context as well. Uh, we tend to think of modern soldiers acting as one. Did that happen here? And uh, how were they successful? How did they make that happen? I think um, a lot of it has to do with what happened prior to the revolution. In many cases, many of these men were on fishing boats where life and death decisions had to be made within seconds. And the color of your skin or your race was irrelevant. It was about trust. And this and trust and teamwork was forged over years of time. And many of them had forged those bonds. They're, they forged bonds of friendship. There were bonds of family, too, where they literally, many of the men in this unit were very interconnected through familial ties, and they were best friends. There was, I researched this, this um, unit extensively. There was no desertion. I, I found a couple examples, which is unheard of for the uh, 18th century American units, where their res desertion was often rife. But it was those close connections with um, family and community that, um, that tied them together. Another question that's come in is from Elizabeth Hickey. I like this one as well. What happens next, right? So the, after the Trenton Princeton campaign, did Colonel Glover and the Marble Hunters return home? become privateers. What do we know about the next door? You've mentioned Elbridge Gary, and that's obviously one example. Uh, but can you tell us a little more about the afterlife? It's, it's, a, um, it's a complicated story. Half the unit, well, maybe less than half the unit, stays with Washington. And this is an extraordinary moment. After, or right before the Battle of Assunpeak Creek, then Washington uses his great oratory abilities to beg and plead the army to stay and many step forward and serve and many of them are marble hunters and many of them die as a result of that service including Dr. Bond. Uh, John Glover um, along with other members of the Marblehead Regiment return home to Marblehead and they form a new, um, Lover is, is made a general. They form a new, uh, he forms, he's part of, he commands a new brigade. They form a new regiment. Um, but many of the men take to the sea. Um, and they take to the sea, in many cases, um, many of the captains, the great captains, Marblehead captains, have become part of the Continental Navy, um, such as John Manley and Tucker. And they are some of the greatest fighting captains of, of, the, of the Revolutionary War. And the book is filled with a, incredible scenes of ship-to-ship -ship fighting, but also ships that are, like, I mean, in some cases, rotting tubs. And these men literally have to make repairs on the fly, or they have to, to make their way to a small cove that's a, that's, that there's hardly anybody there. And then they, they have to drag logs out of there to make masks and everything else. It's really quite extraordinary um, story of American ingenuity. Uh, many of them become privateers. Unlike Washington's Navy, where they were members of the Army that were literally at sea, these are um, individuals that are private, uh, that are, that are, that are um, also earning a commission. Slightly different, but they're, they're, wor they're working in the employ of uh, the Massachusetts government in many cases. Um, many of them die, including Glover's son uh, dies at sea. And many of them are never seen again. Another question that's come in, it's a little specific, but I bet there's a great story here. Uh, Justin Cherry, who's another fellow here at the Washington Library, asked about the average age of the members of the Marblehead Regiment. Uh, what can you tell us about that? Does it, uh, is, are they young, are they old, and is there a wide range? I've been able to, um, I was able to take 
the muster, fi uh, muster rolls that existed. And um, it's fragmentary. The average age was around 24 for many of the men. But it varied. There were some, old, obviously, uh, older men and younger men. Uh, some, some, the book also captures a story of boy soldiers. And um, in many cases, it, they were drummer boys. Um, music was a very important part of um, being able to communicate on an 18th century battle. You needed uh, drums and fife to, to, to relay orders. And many of the younger members were musicians, drums or pipers, and they went to war with their fathers. And we have some really extraordinary stories of uh, father and son teams in the book. Another a question that's coming in, this is from Tammy Manorino. She asked a good question about uh, the recognition. Uh, obviously, your book is a great example of how centuries later we can still discover and recognize uh, the service. Uh, what kind of recognition did these people receive during their lifetime? Most of these men and women received zero recognition. In fact, most of them were bankrupt after the war. And what you see in the pension file applications after the war, if they were lucky enough to even make it that long, they're penniless. And this is, this is especially true for the, um, the soldier mariners of color. They're extremely impoverished. And Glover himself is racked with PTSD. We can kind of divine that through his letters to Washington, where he's not able to sleep um, most of the time. Um, and he's, he, um, you know, Marblehead was a, a source of great wealth in Massachusetts prior to the war. It was the second largest city, and it's really reduced to a shell after the war. And in, individual families are greatly impoverished. In the book itself, in 1777, early seven, late 76, I bring out um, the women of the town, the town of Beverly and, Mass and um, Marblehead. Beverly is also an important part of this book as well. One of the companies um, led by Captain Brown is from Beverly and they have their base there. They literally riot and the women of the town uh, take up muskets and um, raid the food stores of the town because they're starving. But I mean, this is a gritty, gritty war. It's a civil war where Americans are pitted against Americans, but they're impoverished. It's a different war than most people have read in their, um, their grade school history books. Another question coming in from the audience, and I'm, uh, I'm excited to hear your, your thoughts on this one, uh, from Kamala about uh, how did Glover manage to bring together so many different people in this regiment? Can you talk a little bit about the efforts to integrate? what? Are, are there thoughtful and deliberate things that someone like Glover needs to do in order to make this happen? Or did it come out of the, the community uh, from which he came? I think it comes out of the community. Um, there was no like overt effort to coerce people to serve. And I think that's an important element of this book. They, they willingly served. And in many cases, it's the poorest members of the community, and it's, as well as the elite members of the community are all serving together um, side by side. And uh, I mean, you've got literally like Glover and Elbridge Gary and, and Jeremiah Lee, for instance. These are exceptionally, Jeremiah Lee in particular was one of the wealthiest men in the colonies. He is, a, he is initially their, their colonel, um, serving with the other members of the community which are not on well off at all. Um, and they're not doing it uh, under coercion. They're doing it because they feel it's their duty. And what I find really extraordinary is, is the amount of sacrifice as the war progresses. And the community itself is bankrupt. There's a tremendous amount of pressure to return home, to, to, to give up the war. But most of these men, or many of these men, continue their service um, against all odds which I find just extraordinary. One, uh, obviously we're here at Mount Vernon, and so it's a great opportunity to ask a George Washington question. Uh, what was the connection like between Glover and Washington? Did they share 
uh, an intimacy? Did they have uh, a, a candid and frank relationship with one another? What do you know about that? And what can you they tell did. Us? This it's question is coming from Dean Melissa. I do want to acknowledge someone that at Mount Vernon Insiders know well. But tell us a, a little bit about that relationship. relationship is an important one. And it's why these, are, these marble headers are the indispensables. That relationship is forged in early 1775 at the Vassal House. And this is in Cambridge. And it's a giant mansion that Washington um, takes over as his headquarters. And he, it's the Marbleheaders that are, in some ways, the first to, to guard the headquarters. And he requests them um, as time goes on, because he, fo he forms a very intimate relationship of trust with John Glover and with the adjutant um, of that unit at the time, Caleb Gibbs, who later becomes in charge of the lifeguard or the commander in chief's guard. And this relationship is incredibly important. Washington can trust these men at the most crucial inflection points of the war. It's at the American Dunkirk that he places his entire trust on the shoulders of the Marblehead men. It's at Pelham Bay. It's later at Trenton, where John Glover, where Washington asks Glover, can you bring us across the river? He says, don't worry about that. My, my boys have got it. And they had it. He knew, he had that confidence in his, Glover had the confidence in his men, and Washington had confidence in the Marbleheaders. As I said earlier, if Washington was the indispensable man of the revolution, it's the Marbleheaders which were the indispensable men of the revolution. Uh, Margo, Margo has a great question uh, that I'm interested to hear your thoughts on about the training. Uh, what comes into to shaping the ability of this wonderful regiment? Um, it, was it life experience? Was it fishing? Was it the experience that they had coming in before, long before the war broke out? How were they taught, uh, if there was more to it, uh, to effectively uh, be the regiment they became? The, um, the men were, uh, had undergone uh, training as a militia unit prior to the war, where they would, they would train um, in the grounds, in and around Marblehead. And, you know, it was you know, not necessarily very taken very seriously because they'd go right to the, the tavern afterwards and drink punch and, and grog after the training. Um, but it was what really forged these men as what Ed Langle said is arguably the greatest fighting unit ever to take arms for the United States is their experience prior to the war fishing in the Grand Banks and as, tra as, you know, as merchants where they had to battle not only um, the Royal Navy from impressment, but also the Mother Nature and some of the greatest seas at the time. Um, you know, I mean, the, the Grand Banks were unforgiving. Where literally, I, I mean, every year hundreds of men would die from the sea. So this, this bred hard men that were very, very tough Americans. And also some pretty hard drinkers, too. Um, but that's another story. But they were very tough individuals. There's another question uh, that I like coming in, uh, and this is from uh, Frank, uh, who asked about the Marble Hunters involved elsewhere. We talked about some water crossings. Uh, I, we see one on the cover of your book. Uh, were, were any Marble Hunters involved in other campaigns, including in the South, in the Southern campaigns of the war? Not directly. Uh, after after the the Trenton campaign, uh, Glover would operate in the north primarily. I mean, there is a handful of individuals that may have um, effectively served in the south in other units um, because they had traveled that way in one way or another. But for the most part, they had not um, operate, uh, did not operate in the south. But the the story of of the Marblehead men is really unique in, in terms of the special operations like units, uh, operations that they had conducted where they, for instance, they had conducted raids against the British um, and they had even launched a, a series of fire ships against the British in um, you know, a couple weeks before the Battle of Brooklyn where 
several men had died or perished as they drove their ships, flaming ships, directly into what effectively were British battleships. Um, and one of those uh, marbleheaders perished in the, or several part perished in the process, but it's, you know, really extraordinary uh, story of heroism. Uh, another question that I, I'm curious to ask, and this might be my last time, last opportunity because we're running out of time together, uh, but Justin uh, posted a question early on that I'm excited to hear your thoughts about, about leadership. Uh, and he asked about a leadership quality that Washington had that we might learn from. And let me ask you to expand that a bit. Uh, not just Washington, but also other uh, key figures, including Glover. Uh, is there a leadership trait that you see as key to the success of this regiment? Absolutely. It's, this book is filled with leadership examples of, of individuals that were sa willing to sacrifice their very lives and their fortunes for, for their cause, for their country, which I, I can't even, it's mind boggling in many ways to just sort of, to try to describe this, where at the end of the war, they would become, many of these individuals were penniless and they were broken men, um, physically as well as emotionally, uh, scars of war would continue with them. But the leader, one of the leadership traits that they had was they were willing to, um, they would never ask somebody else to do something that they wouldn't w be willing to do. Um, in many cases, they led from the very front and uh, were willing to sacrifice their lives. Um, and that leadership is, is really essential. It's something that is a lesson that we can understand and, and learn from to today. This has been a remarkable opportunity, Patrick. Uh, my camera is gone, uh, but let me just talk to you from here, from where I'm standing at my podium. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, let me ask you to say any closing words that you want to say about your research project here, but also what comes next. Well, I, I, I do want to say thank you to everybody that has stayed this evening and, and, and sacrificed their time for my presentation. I'd, well, I'd really want to thank the, the ladies of, of Mount Vernon for sponsoring me and allowing me to, to um, really conduct research in, I think, one of the finest facilities in America. And it's one of the greatest. I, I've never found a better place to write books uh, here at the DeVos House. It's a special place. And I'm just extremely grateful for the opportunity to, to be here and to have conducted the research and to write this book. The book, everyone, is The Indispensables, the diverse soldier mariners who shaped the country, formed the Navy, and rode Washington across the Delaware. This is the official book release. So thrilled to have Patrick here to talk about this book. Uh, pick it up now. Buy it now. We have it available at the Mount Vernon shops. And thank you so much for being here with us tonight, Patrick and everyone. Thank you. It was an honor, Kevin. Thank you.